Welcome inside the WOSN studios. It's that time of the week again. Time to gather the press in a row and talk high school <laughs> sports. Joined by Todd Walker, Aaron Matthews, Mark Kuntz. I'm Matt Finkel. Guys, let's get started with high school boys basketball. It's the final week of the regular season, so we've had plenty of time to assess everything. What's been the biggest surprise team for you this year? Well, I, you know, I wrote down several candidates. Uh, I think I don't think anybody figured Bluffton would win 15 games, so I, I'll just throw them out as a candidate. Not necessarily they would win the vote, but I think uh, Bluffton at 15 and six to me was certainly a surprise. So I'll nominate the Pirates as uh, one of the surprise teams in the area. No question about it. I'm going to go with Lima Senior guys, and the reason being is when you have, you know, a new program, new implementation of everything. You take four guys, throw them into the mix. How do they mesh with the returning players? And, oh, by the way, you've only lost three games all season. I think, you know, I think you have to go with Lima Senior in that regard. But I also think you need to look into Western Buckeye League as well and look at Salina as well and the play that Chris Ben's team, only three losses, Lima Senior, St. Henry, Lima Central Catholic, a team that has been very, very well this year. Yeah, I was going with Salina as well. I, I don't think anybody's surprised that Salina's at the top, among the top of the Western Buckeye League, but I don't know if anybody thought that the Bulldogs would go undefeated in the WBL. Still have one more game left to play in league action, but I, I think the Salina Bulldogs, the way they've been able to put things together this year, that is, they have surprised me the most. They jumped out to that big lead in the WBL, got the win over Defiance early on, and have been able to keep that going and remain undefeated in league play. That's, uh, that's been a very good job by Chris Ben and company. And to your point, Todd, the way Bluffton started, 100%, that was very surprising. 11-0, if I remember right off the yeah. shoot. And they've carried on to, the, to pick up those 15 wins, and Salina's another good example. Obviously, Lima's senior. I'm surprised that nobody went the negative route. That is an option with this question. I'm not going uh -huh. there either. I'm going to keep it positive. Let's move on. Let's <laughs> hand out some awards now. Let's start with Player of the Year in boys. Well, I, I don't think you can debate this much that it's between two guys. It's Xavier Simpson and Ryan Mikesell. I, mean, I don't, not to discount other people and what they've done, but I don't think anybody comes close to the level they have performed at this season. So you can take your pick. Uh, I, I might go with Xavier Simpson, but I could go with Ryan Mikesell. I'm, I'm very malleable on this point. I think Kyle Lawrence down in Versailles deserves some discussion as well for what he's been able to do. But uh, I think Ryan Mikesell is certainly the, the leading candidate for the player of the year. Not only what he does scoring, but also rebounding. He's averaging a triple-double, also usually around four to six assists a game as well. So doing just about everything for St. Henry. But I'll also throw Jared Poling's name out there for what he has meant for the Perry Commodores. I was leaning Poling in a three-way tie with Mikesell and with X as well. And, you know, Personally, you know, knowing X a little more than I know the other two, I would give a slight edge to X, just as seeing as what he's brought to the table at Lima Senior, but also the dynamic of Ryan Mikesell, a triple-double. He's been a couple times, he's been very close to a quadruple-double, guys. And then Jared Poling, a young man who, you know, has had just a gangbuster season, gets hurt. The talk is he's done for the year. It's his non-shooting wrist. And, oh, by the way, on Tuesday night, he went for 30 and hit eight threes and a win, too. Yeah, so, I mean, did, did we all get uh, snookered there, or did Perry know this the whole time, or what happened there? Did a Come kid on, Tames, holler at your boy. Yeah, you already Coach, know. Coach Tabor on our District Ross show said he, he's be fine. he'll be fine. I remember we were talking, yeah. we were worried, thinking, you know, what's going to happen. He was like, he'll be good, he'll be good, and he's good, I guess. Yeah, well, 17, 18-year-old kids, sometimes they heal up real quick, and it, it, it's a great story that he's able to go uh, for the Commodores, no question. It'll be interesting to see who wins MAC Player of the Year between Versailles, Arns, and St. Henry's Mike. So I think both are deserving. Hey, don't forget Ryan Bruns. And Ryan mix. Bruns as well. I, I think Mike's will probably end up yeah. winning that. For one thing, he, St. Henry's got at least right. a share of the, the league title. That's going to give some votes his way as well. And he outplayed Bruns and Arns when he played them one on one. Mm. Okay, so now let's do coach and team of the year. I'll start. I think. Before you can jump in and, and give the award to Frank Kill, I, I'd like to do Who that. Who says I'm giving it to Frank? No, nobody. Nobody. <laughs> I'd, like Homer. To, I'd like to do that, though, because I think he, he's done a fantastic job this year and replacing guys that you lost on a state championship team like Martise Kimbrough and, and, those, and those players. So and they're right back as a favorite again, I think, in Division Three, He's got to be mentioned in this group. My coach of the year is Quincy Simpson for uh, 
what uh, Aaron talked about as a surprise team of the year. The fact that Q came in first year as a boys varsity head coach. He's got a lot of head coaching experience at other levels. But to come in and have the season they've had, bringing a whole lot of new parts, getting them all going together, and there's always rumblings and controversies all around this program that they've been able to do is go out there just about every weekend and win, and they're in a position to get back to the, uh, the district tournament, maybe even to the regional tournament, which is the first time they've been able to do that for a few years. My coach of the year is Matt Tabler at Perry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 14 wins in a row at one point, uh, a very convincing win, you know, against Sidney Lehman. They had another win against USV, another extremely well-coached team, a team that could make a deep run uh, in the tournament if they knock off Perry, if those two meet up. Um, and I'm also going to give a code nod to Kevin Sensible at Spencerville. Well, I think uh, out of all those names are great names, and I think Frank Kill does deserve a, a lot of consideration. But let's not forget about Chris Ben at Salina. We yes. talked about uh, them being a surprise team. They've run the table to this point in the Western Buckeye League, and they maybe play a little bit different style than most teams in the league. They really get up and down the floor and, and maybe not as deep as they need to be, but he's uh, cajoled that uh, into at least a co-championship in the WBL, so I think he's got to get some consideration. So if you had to pick a team of the year, Todd, would you choose Salina or go elsewhere? A, a team of the year, I think, uh, right now would be incomplete. I mean, that, that's my problem. Well, no, with in it. a month. If, okay. Yeah, and, I mean, that, that would have to figure into it. But uh, I think Salina would have to be high on the list. But uh, all the teams, to me, if, if you win your league regular season title, uh, I'm big on that. I know in a month from now we'll all forget about league titles and all we'll care about is winning the regional or winning the state. But... Uh, teams that win their league titles deserve to be saluted, and uh, Salina will be one of those at least. My team of the year already has won their league title. They've won the Green Meadows Conference. I'm talking about the Wayne Trace Raiders. Yep. A year ago, Wayne Trace won every game except three, and those three were all against Crestview. Well, they beat Crestview two times this season, and they've won another GMC Conference title. A lot of folks are thinking about uh, the Raiders as having a very good shot of making it back to Columbus for the. Somebody said that on a preview show. By Absolutely, the way. first time we've they've quoted been back you a down couple to Columbus times since 2008. Back. I want to say is when uh, Al Welch took them back down. But I, I like the way this Wayne Trace team can play. Obviously, we know about Corbin and Ethan Linder and Matt and I just did the the Wayne Trace Crestview game the other night, and we we're able to see it firsthand. You got the two Linders, but also their role players when they're hitting on all cylinders like they were against Crestview. Their role players makes this a potentially very special team. Ask me April 1st right. when we tape press row Fair that enough. Wednesday because, yeah. it, like Todd said, it's an incomplete for me because we're going to see some teams potentially that are very solid teams go down and go down early. And I'm talking by the district semis. I mean, you, when you look at Division Four and you look at that sectional that will be played at Bath, you've got Spencerville, Upper Soda Valley, Perry, New Knoxville. Who's coming out on that, you know, is, do we know more than likely Spencerville is going to probably come out on that upper part of that bracket there? But that lower bracket, that 8 o'clock game Friday night, a very good team is putting away the basketballs by 10 o'clock that evening. Quickly closing out the awards, let's just name our most improved player of the year. This Ryan Hoying from, uh, from Salina, in my opinion, most improved player of the year. Asked to do more this year as the leader of the Bulldogs, averaging 18 points a game, averaging nine rebounds. Does a little bit of everything, and in my opinion, he was the most. He's the most improved player I've seen as well, uh, from last year to this year. And, and I think he's a young man who's deserving of everything that he'll receive, as far as postseason accolades. And uh, he's already signed to play D2 ball at Ohio Dominican. He's going to be a nice fit there, I think. I, to me, hands down, is Dantes Walton. Uh, yep. His leap has been incredible yeah. in my mind, and not just from last year to this year, but from the beginning of this year to now. I mean, he is really something has clicked with him, and it's amazing to see. In that junior year, you you see that a lot of times with players. That's the year where they start to really jump off the page. I don't think this one's even close. Guys, I want to throw this at you. You know, as the voice of the T-Birds, Dantes went over the 600-point mark. Him and Trey Cobbs both did uh, last week against Spencerville. But Dantes Walton from three on the season, even though he went one for four against uh, He's over Salina, 50%. it's 51% yeah. from distance. Yeah. Yeah, you, As a 6'5 big with a 6'10 wingspan, yeah. the kid can stroke. You look back to last year, Dantes Walton was a complimentary role player in that LCC state championship team. With Martise Kimbrough graduating, with X transferring, you knew somebody was going to have to step up. 
Danton's is the guy who stepped up to become a consistent Mightily. threat. And, and part of that was also with Jake Williams' injury situation that they had to have Dantes step up, and he has done so, and, and even more so. And the fact that he's shooting 50% from the three-point land, that is why this young man, I think, is going to be able to play at the Division I level college basketball in two years. And there has been a lot of it. It all started at flying to the hoop when yeah. he went for 30 points against Kettering Alder. Since then, the interest has been very well received for Mr. Walton and company. Trey Cobbs has also received a lot, and they're both getting a lot of mid-major looks. Um, there have been several schools that have been in for LCC games, have been in for practice. And uh, Dantez, as far as summer ball goes, plays for a team out of Columbus, um, and they play a national schedule as well. And uh, it looks like he'll receive a lot of national attention going on and during the high school offseason. Guys, let me throw one more out there. We talked about Perry and uh, how they – but you said a coach of the year candidate, Matt Tabler. How about Jacoby Lane Harvey? Yes. As uh, Coach Tabler says, his improvement in his second year has really been big, and that's the reason they've been able to uh, weather the storm from some of their graduation losses. So uh, I'll throw that out there. Without a doubt, all good candidates, and it's been fun to watch Dantez emerge as one of the leaders of that team. All right, sectional tournaments coming up a week away. What section – are we most looking forward to? So I know sometimes these games aren't the most competitive. I hit on it already. Right. D4 at Bath. I think there's that, and then there's everybody else, in my opinion, just from a competitive standpoint. I think the other sectional that's a little bit intriguing is the Division Three sectional up at Finley, where uh, Kerry Van Wert winner will take on Liberty Benton, as assuming the Eagles get past Lakota. But Kerry LB, that's the 3-4 seed in that district, or if it's Van Wert, it could be Kerry as well. I think that, that could be a very intriguing section, outside of the, the one at Bath that Aaron already mentioned. You know, I think the D4 at OG could, be, at. could have some nice sub-context. Sub if, if Kaleida wins, if they beat Macomb, they get to play Columbus Grove. We could end up with Miller City, Ottoville, and the other half, an all-PCL sectional with the teams that uh, were right there as contenders. Uh, I think that's one of the uh, more interesting sectionals overall. Agreed. All right, to the NFL now. Browns making news earlier in the week, changing their logo. Some Twitter, some people on Twitter not happy about it. Can they do What? People on Twitter not happy? Anything Never. right. That's the question. Can the Browns do anything right? They're not even on the field. They're still... They went with a brighter crayon. <laughs> Congratulations. You can color the color orange. The do face not mask pass is go. Brown. Do not pass go. The face me. mask is brown. That's, that's different. This just and they used a out. different font for Cleveland Browns. <laughs> this just points out, though, the absurdity it's come to with uniforms and logos and colors. And I, I really don't care. I mean, I'm not a huge Browns fan, but even if I was, you know, uh, tell me who's going to play quarterback Who's going to do this? Oh, no, this is more that? interesting because they, they don't know who's going to play quarterback because he's getting cured off the wild turkey. And, and they're looking you. for a quarterback in the draft, according to. And they've got one coming reports. in to visit to, on Thursday. Yeah. No, but I mean, Todd, I know you're not a fan of the design element of professional sports, but there's a lot of folks that are. And the fact of the matter is, with the pro, with the, the computer revolu revolution, the internet age, the digital age we live in, it allows a lot of folks to be at home designers and come up with some interesting ideas and some interesting That doesn't notions. mean I have they to They release like it. Instagram pages. At Uniform Swag is one of them, by the way. And it's mm -hmm. crazy the stuff they come out with. Yeah, it doesn't mean I have to like it. I mean, I appreciate it. If you like it, I just don't care. I, I can mean, tell you wear one a uniform that Todd likes. with a number on it. I know one that you like. What's that? Orange pants, brown jerseys, BGSU. <laughs> yeah. Those are going to be sweet. Those will be, as long as I can read the numbers. Yes. <laughs> hey, That's LCC will have new away home or away jerseys with bright red numbers next year too. So I'm there happy about that. And Browns fans, of course, are not happy unless they're miserable. So even if this had been the best <laughs> redesign ever, half of them would hate it. Half of them would want it to keep it and the old way. And this is just way. the first part of the redesign. Oh, yeah, we got yeah. more uniforms anguish. are being released in April. <laughs> All right. And so. perhaps Ted Ginn will be in those new uniforms. Well, he'll be fast whether the color is bright orange or not as bright orange. So it doesn't really <laughs> Come, matter. Come uh, April, I'll be sure to ask Todd on his opinion of the new uniforms for the Browns. Until then, we've got a lot of basketball to keep us busy. And thanks, guys. Thank you for joining us on Press Row. Enjoy your games this week, and we'll see you back here next week.